Today, we're going in depth with the Xtool S1. Now, I was one of the lucky few who has sent the S1 pre-release, and unlike some other people on YouTube, I decided to spend a lot more time with this machine to make a video with a ton of details, instead of just publishing something right on the machine release date to take advantage of the YouTube algorithm. And for those of you not familiar with the S1, it's the latest laser engraver and cutter released by Xtool, which places a high priority on safety. So for example, we have this large laser safe viewing window right at the front, and it's got a door switch on it. So when you lift that up, the machine won't run, which will of course protect your eyes as well as your skin. It also features an array of flame detection sensors on the inside, and the machine is compatible with their ecosystem of other safety devices, such as their fire suppression set. Now, all of that safety does not come at the sacrifice of performance. This S1 is equipped with a 40 watt blue diode laser module, and those laser heads are interchangeable. So you can swap it out for their IR module, as well as their 20 watt blue diode laser module. And the S1 also has other amazing features like dynamic autofocus, so you can engrave curved surfaces, and it's compatible with their conveyor feed system. And so I'll be walking you guys through the machine setup and taking you through all of the intricate details of getting the S1 working with the Xtool Creative Space software. I've got a ton of material examples for you guys. And as always, I share all of my machine settings for those materials. Plus I've got some exclusive upgrades and accessories. And lastly, I just wanna say thank you to Xtool for sending me the S1. And we've got a lot to cover in this video, so let's get started. We'll begin with the unboxing with which Xtool never seems to disappoint, and the S1 is no different. The S1 is a fairly large machine, so it looks like they took every precaution necessary to make sure that the machine gets to you in one piece. After removing the very large Velcro straps and protective foam covering, we can get on to removing all of the plastic protective covering. It would be very disappointing if that very large green tinted viewing window at the front of the machine came scratched or cracked, and it looks like in this case, mine arrived in perfect condition. Under the front window, we get the beautifully branded and packaged Xtool instruction manual and material sample pack. And again, the presentation here is excellent and all of the additional accessories are neatly and safely tucked away underneath inside of the machine frame. And so this is where you'll find the exhaust hose, an accessory box, a long skinny box holding the material support prisms, a bunch of extra foam where you'll find the power supply tucked away inside and the power supply cable as well as the 40 watt blue diode laser module head. And as we put our accessories aside to get ready for the assembly, we can just take a moment here to appreciate how sleek and sexy this machine is. I really like this color scheme with the satin black panels, gloss black lettering combined with the green viewing window and green accents on this machine. I've really got to hand it to whoever's in charge of the appearance of the Xtool products. You've done a really nice job. And so as I alluded to earlier, inside one of the green packages is the material sample pack, and in the other one is the very nicely detailed instruction manual. Now if you're watching this, maybe you prefer video instructions, but Xtool always does a very nice job with their printed manuals. Now we can move on to the setup and assembly, and the S1 isn't too much work to get started. So you're going to open up the black box where you'll find the tool kit. Xtool keeps things as simple as possible with a single tool to assemble your machine. You'll see these yellow stickers here on the left and right hand side, and they're pointing to these small rubber bumpers, which keep the gantry from moving around while shipping. Each side, left and right, has two screws to be removed, and once you remove them, you can pull the entire gantry forwards. Then we can remove our laser module from the bag, and on the left hand side you'll find a connector receptacle and we'll be connecting this to the dangling wiring harness on the left hand side of the carriage. Now the connector is keyed so you can't put it in backwards, just insert it and then take the air assist tube and put it over the fitting right beside that receptacle. At the back of the module you'll find this standoff looking feature and that's going to slot into the hole in the carriage. Line up the peg and the slotted hole push the laser module into the carriage and then push down. The module is on springs, so you'll likely compress the springs like I did there, but it should lock in place. And then from your hardware kit, you can use the two M3 by eight socket head cap screws to secure the laser module. Now we can grab our focusing probe and it magnetically attaches to the side of the laser module. It does a nice job of self-locating, so you can put it on the side of the module and the magnets will take care of the rest. 
Now at the back of the machine, there is this vent, and it's got four M3x8 socket head cap screws holding it in place. Unless you're using your S1 outside, you're likely going to want to use a hose to relocate these smoke and fumes out of your workspace. Now obviously the three inch hose from Xtool will fit directly on the back, but I also make an adapter to fit the more common four inch dryer duct style hose. You can find this adapter on my website, embracemaking.com. And the reason that I would personally go with the four inch hose is that it comes in very long lengths at a pretty affordable price. And if your window or door that you're routing your exhaust out of is a very long distance away, you can use one of those four inch inline duct fans. I'll put a link to one of those in the video description down below to pull the smoke and fumes through many feet of that four inch hose. Now, if you don't have a window or door nearby, a good solution here is to use the X-Tool hose and hook it up to their fume and smoke purifier. This one is their larger floor mounted model and maybe I was just missing something, but I couldn't get the S1 hose to hook up to any of the adapters. And so again, I made my own and of course I'll make it available to you on my website. And at the back of the smoke and fume purifier, there is an exhaust port. And even though the air coming out of that would be filtered, some of you may have a very sensitive nose and you may want to route that outside of a window or door. So I have a three inch to four inch hose adapter for that as well. You can find links to everything I just described in the video description down below. While we're at the back of the S1, you can find the other various connectors and ports, as well as the power switch. Now the bottom USB port is for the key, and you can think of this like a lockout switch, the machine won't run without it. Above that is the input power, and between the USB key and the input power is your USB connection to your computer. Xtool includes a USB-C cable with a right angle connector, which is quite nice because it routes it out to the side of the machine and then of course you can place your computer or laptop beside your S1. On the right hand side are the push fit connectors for the air assist which is on the top and the fire safety set which is on the bottom. They made the ports different sizes so you can't mix up the two but the hoses are the same size and adapter doesn't seem to be included. So for now I'm not going to hook up the fire safety set and on the top port I'm going to hook up the air assist. Inside your workspace, you can support your work pieces with these prism material risers, which are included with the machine. And you can just set them down on the bottom of the S1 and then place your work piece on top. Lifting your material is good practice for through cuts and those prisms kind of just sit there, but I do have a good solution for arranging them if you keep watching later in the upgrade section of this video. Now, if you bought the S1 and you got yourself the basic kit, it includes the air assist as well as this honeycomb panel. After placing it inside of the machine, you'll want to push it all the way to the right and to the back. Now it does work a lot better than those little prisms, but it's also a lot taller so you do lose some height. You can only process thinner materials when using this honeycomb panel. Xtool does offer a riser base to get more depth inside your machine, but they didn't send me one so I can't really show you that. Now we're ready to fire up our S1 for the very first time with the switch at the back. And if it doesn't immediately turn on, twist the red emergency stop button at the right hand side of the machine counterclockwise. The lights should turn on, the laser head will move, and the button at the front of the machine will illuminate. Anytime I test a new machine, I like to start with a very simple wood engraving. So we're gonna be using one of these basswood sheets that comes in the material sample kit. Now the S1 is compatible with Lightburn, but I will be using the Xtool Creative Space software I find it easier to use, plus they're constantly updating it, and we are, after all, testing an Xtool product, so we might as well use their software. And the first time you connect it to the S1, you'll probably be prompted to update the firmware. This can take a few minutes, so be very patient. Do not turn off the machine during this process, even if it looks like nothing is happening. The button at the front of the machine may be flashing white and purple, and during this process, you may also see the gantry and laser head move around a little bit. This is completely normal, and eventually you'll get a message saying the firmware update succeeded. Now, depending on whether or not you've used other Xtool products, you may notice something a little different here, and there's a red crosshairs here on the screen in the Xtool Creative Space software, and that represents the position of the laser head. And this is not something that you would see on machines like the D1 Pro. And so what I've done here is I've imported a raster image, and this is just gonna be a grayscale engraving test that we're gonna run. On the right hand side, I've pre-selected the material as the three millimeter basswood preset. And then I tried clicking the distance button to autofocus the laser head, but I just wanna show you guys that when the laser module is way off to the left hand side, 
it's out of the range where it can actually take a measurement. And so with my hand, I manually drag the laser head over to the bottom left hand corner of the material. And you can see the red crosshairs moving there. And then in Xtool Creative Space, if I go ahead and click the distance measurement button, the S1 will then probe that point on the material and focus the laser to the top of that surface. After the S1 probes a surface, it's normal for the laser head to travel to the back of the machine to reset the probe. Now the next thing we can do is tell the software where our material is and how big it is using the two point positioning system. So on the right hand side, there's a button that says start marking. We're gonna click that and this will bring up a screen that's gonna give us some basic instructions on how to mark our material. It first wants us to line up the laser crosshairs with the top left hand corner of our material. And now you don't have to go right to the edge of the material if you don't want to. You can place the laser crosshairs somewhere on the inside of your material. And in this case, I'm going to do that because I don't want a laser over top of those magnetic material hold down clips that I'm using on the honeycomb bed. And so I'll go ahead and position the crosshairs close, but not over top of those clips. And I'll press the button on the front of the machine. And in the software, you'll see that that point has now been recorded. Now we need to move the crosshairs to the bottom right hand corner of the material, or at least the space that we want to laser within. Again, I'm not going to go right to the bottom of the material. I'll get close to that clip, but I won't go over top of it. Once I'm happy with that position, I'll press the button, which is lit up blue on the front of the machine, and the software will record that second point. And then we can go ahead and click the done button. And once we click the done button, you'll see a green bounding box show up on the workspace here in Xtool Creative Space. And this is now where you can drag and resize your image to fit inside of that green box. Once you're happy with the size and position, you can click the framing button in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. And then when you're ready, you press the button on the front of the Xtool S1 and the laser crosshairs will frame the position of exactly where you have put that image. You may also notice that during framing, the laser module moves up and down in the Z axis as well. Now that we're finished framing, if you click on the image, you can adjust some of the power and speed settings. And so I'm gonna bump up the power to 30% and I'm gonna leave this speed at 200 millimeters per second. And I'm gonna leave this in grayscale mode. Now the reason I'm increasing the power from the Xtool presets is that I've already done one or two engravings on this machine and they looked a little washed out and too light for my liking so by increasing the power we'll get a bit of a darker engraving. I've said this in some of my other videos but don't be afraid to deviate from some of the Xtool reference settings. Some of them are spot on while others are actually way off. Now in order to start the job we still have to press start at the top right hand corner of the screen and don't forget to close the lid on the S1 because it does have a safety switch on the lid. And so if you don't close it, you end up with an error warning you that the front lid is open. From what I understand, the S in S1 stands for safety. And so if you're going to be using this machine without safety glasses, they want to make sure that that front lid is closed while the laser is activated. Based on the packages available on the Xtool website, it looks like I was sent the basic kit, which included that honeycomb bed, as well as the Xtool Air Assist. This is a smart Air Assist module, which connects to the S1 with a USB cable at the back of the machine. And in the auto mode, it allows the controller on the S1 to modulate the Air Assist according to the job being processed. For this engraving job, I'll put the Air Assist in auto mode and I'll clear that error from the lid I'll restart the job, press the button on the front of the S1, and the engraving process will start. This job took roughly 14 minutes at 200 millimeters per second. Now the machine can go faster, and if I had set it to a faster speed, I would have increased the power a little more. But at this point, I'm not looking to test the speed. I'm more interested in the range of light to dark, and that's why I have this grayscale test here. And so when I flip the board over, that was the Xtool preset at 25%, which I thought was a bit too light. And so on this side is the 30% power at 200 millimeters per second, which I was much happier with. I'm gonna be using those same settings on this circular piece of wood. 
and I've gone ahead and probed the surface. And now when it comes to the two point positioning on a circle, you can try and line up the crosshairs with the corners of an imaginary box drawn around that circle. But what I find is a little bit easier is to just grab two points on the diameter of the circle. With a circle, it's still a little tricky because you will still have to eyeball it and make sure you're getting the diameter. But instead of a box, you'll just end up with a line. The green line represents the circle's diameter. And so I can bring in my image and I can resize it to sort of fit within the diameter of the circle. And now my image when centered across that line should fit within the circle. Now this is just a simple black and white image. So on the right hand side in the settings under bitmap mode, I changed that to Jarvis instead of grayscale. And again, I'm using 30% power at 200 millimeters per second. When framing the object, you'll see that it overshot the circle a little bit. And that's only because of the white space around the embrace making logo. This job here took about seven minutes, but again, we could drastically reduce that time. I'm just trying to give you guys a good starting point in terms of these settings for engraving something like this common basswood. The engraving looks really sharp and consistent. I do not see any scan lines and there are no charring or burn marks around the engraving. And keep in mind here that this circle was cut out on a different machine. So the charring around the edges of the circle were produced by something other than the S1. Next, we're gonna engrave this bamboo cutting board and I've used the laser crosshairs to square it up inside the machine. I've also already gone ahead and used the two point positioning system to grab the opposite corners. And you can see that green box here representing the size of the bamboo cutting board. Now for this job here, I wanna show you guys what not to do so you don't waste a ton of time like I did with this very inefficient method of engraving. This image that I've imported is just a black and white raster image. So when I click on it and we go to change some of the settings, again, I'll switch over to Jarvis. Now this is on bamboo. So to get a darker engrave, I had to jack the power up to 50%. I'm gonna leave the speed at 200. But the mistake that I've made here that I wanna point out is that I'm using a raster image. For a job like this, where I'm using most of the work area and most of this image is empty white space, when the S1 goes to process this job, it's gonna scan over all of that white area. Therefore, this job, which should only take a few minutes at most, will take over an hour to complete. It would have been way more efficient to either import the vector files and do this, or take that raster image and trace it using the Xtool Creative Space software. And we'll go through that in an upcoming chapter of this video. Now we're gonna set up a through cut and we're gonna be using that same bamboo cutting board that I just engraved on top of. Now I've imported these vector circles here and I'm gonna be placing them in the middle of the board. With both circles selected on the right hand side, you can see the processing type is set as cut. Power, I'm gonna to set to 95 and speed at three millimeters per second. Now this board is about 15 millimeters thick. So ideally I'd like to set the focus eight millimeters lower than the top surface. And in the settings on the right hand side, you can offset the focus. So it says lower the focus, but the maximum you can go is six millimeters. And so I'm gonna lower the focus six millimeters into the wood. I'm also gonna take the air assist off of auto and I'm gonna set it to max. I've seen videos of people cutting through wood at least this thick, sometimes in one pass or even two or three at most. But me personally, I've never been able to accomplish this. Maybe it's the wood I'm using in other videos. I've tried plywood in this video with the S1, I'm trying bamboo, but the result is always fire. At that slow speed, it's just way too much heat in a small area. Now I could increase the speed, which would require me to do more passes. And that approach worked for me on the 40 watt module on the D1 Pro, but quite frankly, I just don't have the patience to do 10 to 15 passes to get through a piece of wood. There are much more efficient ways to cut through wood. And so while it is possible, it just doesn't seem like the most efficient way to cut through thick work pieces. That being said, I'm always open to learning something new. So if you guys have any suggestions for me, or if I'm just using the wrong materials for this, please let me know in the comments section down below. Now cutting through thinner materials is a lot less tricky. What I have here is some three millimeter basswood, which should be very easy for us to get through. For this material, we'll go through the typical workflow. So we'll start by probing the surface and then we'll take the two points. And in this case, I'm gonna use my diameter method that I showed you earlier. So our green bounding box is just a line. Now I've got my raster image that I've imported and I'm gonna use the trace function in order to get a vector outline. It might be a little difficult to see, but the blue vector outline is selected and a selected cut as the processing type. 
and in the material selection, I've selected three millimeter basswood. Now, power for this preset is 100, speed is 25, so I'm gonna reduce the power to 95, but I'm also gonna reduce the speed pretty significantly down to 20 millimeters per second. I'm gonna lower the focus one millimeter into the wood. Ideally, I would have liked to have selected 1.5 millimeters, but it only seems to allow me to put in whole numbers. Now, when I click on process in the preview window, I still see the black section of the raster image. So this doesn't seem right. And so you can see if I click on the white area, the raster image is still visible. So even though I've traced it, it didn't get rid of that. So I've clicked on the raster image, I've clicked on ignore, and now when I go to process, it's just the outline. And this is exactly what I'm looking for because I'm looking to cut out the logo and not engrave it. Now usually when you get a nice clean cut and you go to pick up your workpiece, all of the inner parts fall out. And if you look at the back of this piece, you can still see that these inner parts are still connected. Now, if I press on some of them, some of them will come out pretty easy, but other ones will get stuck and leave a nasty tear out. So what I've done is I've brought in the original piece here that we engraved in the previous chapter of this video. I'm gonna try and align the graphic onto that piece, and I'm gonna try and cut out the engraved section. So in this case, I've left the power at 95 and I've reduced the speed even more to 15 millimeters per second and this should result in a nice clean through cut. It seems like with some of the X tool reference settings, they've overestimated the power of their laser modules, and in some cases you have to bump up the power or reduce the speed to get a nice clean result like this, but when you do get it right, it is very good. These cuts have zero charring around the edges. The dark little shadows that you may see there are from the original engraved sections, but otherwise this was a perfect cut. Scoring is a topic I don't see frequently covered, and if you're not familiar, scoring is just a cut that doesn't go all the way through. And because it doesn't go all the way through, you can kind of think of it as a deeper engrave. And so I brought back the bamboo cutting board, squared it up, probed the surface, and used the two-point measuring system. I brought in another raster image, and I used the trace feature to vectorize it, and that way we can use the score feature, because as a raster, you can only select engrave. Earlier in the video, I had another example where I had a raster image with a lot of white space, and it took a really long time to process that. And so by vectorizing it and using score, all of these blue lines that are traced around the black parts of the image, the S1 will basically trace those lines out and give me the same effect as an engrave, but just along the blue lines. If you're using the trace function to score or engrave, you're going to want to zoom into those blue lines and use these sliders in the trace feature there to make sure none of your blue lines are overlapping like I did. Now I can drag and reposition the vector result into my bounding box and I can select the old raster image in the background and delete it. And whether it's a vector or raster image with the object selected, you can use the arrow keys on your keyboard to make fine adjustments to the position. Over on the right hand side, I've made sure I've selected score, I've set the power to 35% and the speed to 200 millimeters per second. When using score, you'll notice that there's no bitmap mode options, so no grayscale Jarvis and that sort of thing. And that's because scoring is a lot like cutting and less like engraving. And I've been using it to have the laser trace out all of those hexagons without going over any of the white space in the image, saving me a ton of time, and I'll be able to get a nice dark engrave on this bamboo. And so while the S1's running, you'll notice it's not scanning left to right, and it's gone ahead and like I said, traced over all of those hexagons following the lines. But unlike a through cut, I've only marked the surface and it took me a fraction of the time as if I had used the engrave feature. Now, if I want those hexagons a little darker, I'm gonna rerun this, do a second pass, I've left the power setting the same and I've reduced the speed to 150 millimeters per second. The result will now be darker lines and another trick here to get thicker lines if that's what you are after would be to autofocus the laser a few millimeters above the surface and now the laser beam will be out of focus, it'll be larger and it will leave wider lines when you run it over that surface. In my case, I wanted my lines to be a bit thinner and I was very happy with this result. After spending some extra time with the X-Tool S1, I found a handful of things slightly annoying and I set out to improve them. The first thing I made was this button cover, and if you guys follow my videos, I've made something very similar for the X-Tool D1, and that's because the S1 and the D1 both have these buttons that sit proud of the panel that they're mounted to. And the problem with this is that it's very easy to accidentally press these buttons. The S1 is a pretty deep machine at about 22 inches or 560 millimeters, and so when you go to put it on a table, the front of the machine will be sitting pretty much right at the end of a table if it's about two feet in depth, 24 inches. And so I can't tell you how many times my leg or hip 
has accidentally pressed that button while I've been adjusting things inside of the machine. On the D1 Pro, the button is on the top of the frame and you could actually accidentally start the laser with your hands in the machine. On the S1, the laser won't start with the lid up, so at least it's not a safety concern, but it is really annoying because it will throw the machine into error and then you have to reset it before you start your job again. You can find the cover on my website, embracemaking.com, and it attaches with some double-sided tape, which is included with the cover. And the nice thing about the cover is that it does not block the LED ring light inside, so you can still see those colors very clearly. And the last thing I like about having a cover is that kids or pets won't accidentally press the button as well with the cover on. The next thing I found annoying were these material prism holders. And while I appreciate Xtool includes them with the S1, they tend to slide a lot along the bottom base. And in fact, they're so easy to slide and move around that in this clip here, you can see that the air assist actually moves them. On that large piece of bamboo, it wasn't such a big deal, but if you're using a smaller workpiece, when those prisms move, your workpiece will also move in the middle of a job, and it's clearly going to ruin the result. To address this, I've designed these prism holders that interlock with one another, and the prisms sit in the grooves on the top. These will keep the prisms from moving around, plus it makes them much easier to align, so you get a nice even spacing between all of those prisms. Now they are made of plastic, so you will want to avoid cutting directly over top of them. Position your workpiece somewhere in the middle, but if you do happen to catch one, they are just made of a corn-based plastic, so there is no PVC or ABS. The other nice thing about these holders is that the prisms can be spaced closer together to fit smaller workpieces on there so they don't fall through. The button cover and the prism holders are sold together as a kit on my website, embracemaking.com. The next thing I want to talk about is fixtures because I love using fixtures to increase efficiency and the accuracy of my work. I've got these round fake leather patches from the Xtool selected materials and what's cool about these is that when you laser them they turn silver. There's also no PVC in them so they're laser safe but the annoying thing here is that they're round and as I showed you guys earlier in the video the two point positioning system is not the best for round objects so let's take our round object and turn it into a square. Now instead of trying to eyeball an imaginary box around your circular object we can use the laser crosshairs to grab the real corners of this fixture. Then we can use a template in Xtool Creative Space to position our image very accurately on top of our circular object. For rectangular, square, and irregular shaped objects, I do have another fixture, and this is a nine in one jig that holds various different materials. You can hold things like the Xtool pendants, metal USB thumb drives, military tags, metal business cards, these Xtool leather patches, aluminum wallets like this red one here, amongst other things like square coasters. I originally designed these fixtures for the Xtool F1, but I found that they worked beautifully inside of the S1 as well. On the Xtool F1, it's a small machine and you can only put in one fixture at a time, but the nice thing about the S1 and its much larger processing area is that you can take multiple fixtures and you can panelize them. Unlike the more expensive Xtool P2, the S1 doesn't have a camera for positioning objects inside of the work area. We can get around that by using fixtures to accurately position multiple objects all at once and increase efficiency. So we'll run an example here with these aluminum wallets. We'll begin by putting our laser module somewhere near the top left hand corner and our two fixtures are placed side by side touching one another. Now I'm going to take this square and I'm going to square up our fixtures with respect to the machine frame. You can use the flat face on the right hand side of the inner tub of the Xtool S1. Now the bottom does have a little bit of a round edge, so you'll want to move your square up over top of that round edge so you're catching the nice flat face. Once our square is in position, we can slide it up against the front edge of the fixtures and we'll make sure that both of them are touching the square and now those two fixtures should be squared up inside of our machine perfectly. You can slide your gantry back and forth along the X and Y axes just to make sure that the laser crosshairs lines up perfectly with those edges. It's just a way of double checking that your fixtures are square. Now we're ready to set the focus to the top of the aluminum wallet. So I'll drag the laser module over top of one of those wallets and I'll use the software to initiate the autofocus. Then we'll use the two point positioning and set our first point to the top left corner of our leftmost fixture. 
The next corner to mark will be the bottom right hand corner of the rightmost fixture. And you'll see when I do this, I'm moving one axis at a time. So I'm moving the Y down and the X to the right. Try not to move both at once and you'll find that you'll get a much more accurate result. This will produce a bounding box that fits around both of the fixtures. The next step is to import the templates and if you've ordered these fixtures from my website, you'll have the templates automatically emailed to you after you place your order. I'm going to take the first template and I'm going to align it with the bounding box to the left hand side. And so three of the edges of the template will align with the green edges that make up our bounding box from the two point measuring system. Over on the right hand side, I'm going to click on ignore so that these templates don't get processed. I'm going to copy it and I'm going to paste it. And when I go ahead and paste it, it inherits the properties of the first one. So it will automatically be ignored. And now I'm going to align the second template with the right top and bottom edges of the two point positioning. And just a reminder, you can use the arrow keys on your keyboard to make fine adjustments to the position of those templates. And now our templates on our screen represent our fixtures in physical space inside of the machine. I've now brought in a raster image of the Xtool logo and I've moved it to the second layer inside of Xtool Creative Space. Now I can zoom in and position this image over top of the area of the fixture that reads aluminum wallet. And that's because of course we're processing aluminum wallets. I'm using the arrow keys on the keyboard to slightly nudge the position of the logo around and then on the right hand side, you can see it's already set to engrave. I'm going to set the power to 13%. I'm going to leave the speed at 80 millimeters per second. I'm going to save this setting as aluminum wallet. Now these settings worked very nicely for me with the 40 watt module on the D1 Pro. And so I'm going to go ahead and assume that for the 40 watt module on the S1, these should also work nicely. Now I brought in a second logo, which is the YouTube logo. And again, I'm placing it on layer two, the same as the Xtool logo. I'll position this one over the right hand side template. And again, I can use the arrows on the keyboard or I can click on the image and I can use the text fields on the top to move the position of this image exactly where I need it to be. On the right hand side, we're setting it to engrave. And because we had saved our previous settings, I can just select aluminum wallet from the user presets. If you guys are processing a lot of these same materials, it's always nice to save your presets so that you don't have to go back and check them in your notes. Now we can start our job and let the S1 work its magic. Now one thing I wanna mention here is the only limitation to these fixtures is that you need to be processing materials that are the same height. You can only set the focus distance to a single value, so it works best if everything is at the same height. Now, I love the way these wallets turned out, and they happen to be the exact same size as a Ridge wallet. So if you guys are engraving Ridge wallets for people, you'll know that they are very expensive, and by having a fixture, there's just a lot less of a chance that you're gonna screw something up. But if you guys are looking for this less expensive wallet here, as well as any of the other materials that I'm using in this video, I'll put links to those in the video description down below. I also wanna demonstrate that these fixtures will still fit if you're using the Xtool Honeycomb bed, and that's even without a riser base on the S1. I'm gonna use the same square here to line up the fixture, and with the Honeycomb bed, they come with these magnetic clips, and these are useful for just holding that fixture in place. Now in this case, I'm gonna be using a Xtool metal business card. In the last example, I left my square in the machine while the job was running, but this time with the whole thing raised up on top of the honeycomb bed, the carriage will actually hit the square and we definitely don't want that. So if you're using the honeycomb bed, just make sure that you take your square out. In this example, I'm only using a single fixture. So I've gone with the same process, probing the top of the metal business card, taking the two points, the top left hand corner and the bottom right hand corner of the fixture with the two point measurement system, I've got my single green bounding box, the template loaded up and fit inside of that box. And now I've imported my image that I want to engrave on that metal business card. I placed the image over the area labeled metal card. And on the right hand side, I've got the settings, 20% power, 200 millimeters per second speed. And I've set my bitmap mode to Jarvis instead of grayscale because it's a black and white image. Now these settings come from the Xtool reference settings for the metal business card. However, for some reason they have the lines per centimeter set to 80 instead of 100. So I set it back to 100. 
This will prevent those horizontal lines from appearing that you just saw in the first preview. And when we go to hit process again, the second preview should look better. When processing this job, you'll notice the metal business card moving around here and the job got ruined by the air assist. So the air assist was on auto, which turns out to be a little too strong. I just set it to off for this job and now that very light metal business card is not getting blown around. The result here is a beautifully marked metal business card and although I used the settings for a black metal business card, there were no settings in the reference X-Tool settings for gold cards, but they work just the same. A few minutes ago, I told you guys about these super cool X-Tool fake leather patches that turn different colors when you laser them. So this one here is a brown leather patch that turns gold when you laser it. Since I haven't moved my fixture from the last job, I don't need to redo the two point measurement system. All I need to do is probe the surface to get the right focus height for this patch. Now I can bring in the design with this very recognizable pattern that I think will look stunning in brown and gold. I'm going to position it over the area labeled two by three patch. And for this, I'm gonna dive into the X tool reference settings and I'm gonna select brown to gold laser patch. On the right hand side, like I've done with many of the other examples, I'm gonna change from grayscale to Jarvis and that's because I have this black and white image. I also just wanna point out here that on the template, you'll see other measurements like one millimeter, two millimeters and so forth. And those are for the X tool F1. So on the S1, you can just ignore those measurements. In this case here, the X tool reference settings were absolutely perfect for these brown leather patches. In my videos, I like to have fun with recognizable logos but I always point out that I'm not in the business of selling these and I would recommend that you don't do that either. Selling things with copyrighted or trademark logos that you don't have the appropriate license to do so can land you in some legal trouble, so try and avoid that. Now I'll run an example with the round fixture and I've got this black fake leather patch and rather than using the two point positioning across the diameter like I showed you guys earlier in the video, the fixture will give us a much more accurate result. And just like the multi fixture, I'm gonna use the square to line this one up in the exact same manner. I'm gonna drop in the patch, probe the surface of this patch to get the autofocus height, and then use the top left and bottom right hand corner for the two point positioning system. The circular fixture has its own template, which again will be included if you purchase these from my website. And we're gonna import that into the project and position it in the exact same way within the green bounding box created by the two point measurement system. Never resize the template. If your two point measurement is slightly off like mine is here, just center the template inside of that green box. Do not resize it. And now I've brought in my logo that I'm gonna engrave on this patch. I'm gonna be centering this logo with respect to the template. In this case, this image has a white background so it's a little harder to see exactly where the position is. When working with the circular template, it's a lot easier if you bring in images with transparent backgrounds, but it's still easy enough to position right in the middle. And while that job's running, one more reminder to always click on the template and select ignore, so the template does not get processed in your job, and it's just the logo. And this black patch turned out beautiful with the exact same settings as the brown patch, 10% power at 140 millimeters per second. We have one final example using this round stainless tag from the X-Tool materials. And again, it's set up inside of the circular fixture. I'll skip over the fixture and template setup since we've already gone through a bunch of examples. And I'll skip to the part here where I import this logo and this time it's a vector image. It's obvious with a transparent background, it's much easier to see where we're positioning the graphic with respect to the template. And because it's a vector file, I can select the text object and delete it because I don't want it. Over on the right hand side under material, we'll select more and we'll find the stainless steel dog tag setting in the Xtool reference material settings. In the bottom left hand corner, you can see that we have two layers right now. And if I select the layer in the back, which is the template, we'll make sure it's set to ignore. And if I select layer two in the foreground, we'll have it set to output. I'll change the bitmap mode to Jarvis again because it's a black and white image. After that, it's just a matter of clicking process and the job is done in a few seconds because the tag is so small. I personally love using this logo when I test machines because of the very fine details. And you can see here that the S1 even captured the very small text above the horse. I thought this was pretty impressive and I was also very happy with the perfect positioning of the logo right in the center of this object. 
The very last topic we're going to cover is curved surfaces. I think this is the coolest feature of the S1. So what I have here is a wooden serving dish. Now I have no idea what type of wood it is, but I know that it has a curved surface on the back and we're going to attempt to engrave along that curve. On the Xtool website, they point out some things to be aware of when measuring the curved surface, such as measuring surfaces greater than 15 degrees from horizontal. And I'll show you guys what happens here if you try that. The first thing that's likely to happen is that your material will move and then of course you won't get a measurement at all. To avoid that, I've just used some painter's tape to tape the wood down and I'll move my measurement point up the curve. This point on the surface is probably still more than 15 degrees from horizontal and it worked on the top left hand corner of the object but on the bottom right because the probe is on the right side of the laser module, the laser module itself hit the material before the probe did. The module gets violently driven into the workpiece and eventually there's an error thrown and now we know how not to do things. So in Xtool Creative Space, on the top right hand corner, we can click Curve Process and then we can click Curve Measure and that's going to bring up this screen here where we can start marking the top left and bottom right hand corners of the area that we're interested in measuring. The S1 will probe that top left hand corner and then it can manually move the laser head down to the bottom right corner where I'm interested in measuring, click on Vertex 2 and now it will take a measurement of that position there. I moved my measurement point up the curve, so this time there was no collision. Now Xtool Creative Space will recommend a matrix of measurement points, but you can change the density of this matrix. So I'm gonna change it to eight by 10. That's gonna give us 80 points to measure across that surface. As you can imagine, this is going to take a few minutes, so you're gonna to have to be patient here. I've sped this portion of the video up, so don't get too excited, it's not that fast. Once it's done, you'll see the mesh representing the surface that you're going to want to engrave on. There are some sliders and buttons that you can play with to adjust the smoothness and tension of that mesh. Perhaps if you've measured something with a bumpy or non-uniform surface, you may want to play with these sliders a little bit to just even out your mesh so the laser head won't be going up and down too much. In my case, the object was pretty smooth and I didn't really have to do anything. At the bottom, you can change to the different views. So a top view here, and it highlights this area in yellow. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that it's suggesting maybe the angle is a little bit too severe in that area, and it's giving me a warning, but it still allows me to proceed with processing this job. Now I'm gonna bring in my vector file of this pattern that I'm gonna engrave on the surface, and I'm going to resize it to fit within the highlighted area, which represents the curved surface that we just measured. You won't be allowed to place objects outside of that area, so if it doesn't fit, you can unlock the height and width relation, and you can sort of skew your image a little bit to fit inside. As I mentioned earlier, I have no idea what type of wood this is, so I'm gonna set the power to 10%, and the maximum speed while doing a curved surface is 30 millimeters per second. You cannot go faster than that. When I click process, I see that something doesn't look right here. That's way too much black. I don't wanna be engraving all of that. And I noticed that I have a second layer there underneath. So it looks like it's trying to process the layer behind, which shows up in purple right now. So I can hide that layer. I can also click on it and hit ignore. So that does not get engraved. And it's only the pattern in black that will be engraved in this instance. So now when I click on process, this looks a lot better and we can start our job. Watching the laser module very closely, you can see how it's adjusting up and down to follow that curve. And this will maintain that focus across that surface and make sure that we get a very consistent line width while engraving. And this process is super cool to watch, but quite frankly, at 30 millimeters per second, eventually you do get tired of watching it. This job took two and a half hours. Now, to be fair, at the time of this video, the feature is in beta release, but I don't think you're ever going to see significantly higher speeds as they probably don't want you crashing your tool head at full speed. But regardless, if you're into engraving curved surfaces, those final results are definitely worth waiting for. And so that wraps up the bulk of this video. I hope you guys found all of those details very helpful. And my overall impressions of the S1 have been very positive so far. Uh, it's a really highly polished machine and Xtool definitely delivered again on the S1. It's pretty obvious that they're trying to create an ecosystem of parts and accessories that are cross compatible with all of their machines. Now the Xtool equipment definitely isn't cheap, but by creating this large ecosystem of parts and accessories, it seems like they're interested in supporting them all in the long run. 
so it can make you feel better about also investing in their tools in the long run. In terms of things the S1 is lacking, it doesn't have a camera like the more expensive P2. Now in lieu of the camera, it uses that two point positioning system, which works really well in most cases. It's a little more challenging for round and circular objects, but I also showed you guys how to work around that. Now, I thought the dynamic autofocus was a pretty slick trick for engraving those curved surfaces. In the future, I'm definitely gonna try and find more applications for that. And the only thing that I really struggled with on the S1 was cutting through thicker pieces of wood in a minimal number of passes, but that's something that I always struggle with. So maybe that's just a uh, user error. doesn't really matter if it's the S1, the D1 or other brands. I just can't seem to get through wood in only a few passes without setting it on fire. I also really like the fully enclosed design. It makes you feel so much better about using this machine when other people are around. You don't have to worry about blinding them. Plus the enclosure makes sucking smoke and fumes out so much easier than obviously an open frame machine. And the only downside to the enclosure though is that it's pretty shallow. So you'd have to buy their riser kit if you wanna fit objects in with a greater depth. And so that's it. Let me know about your first impressions about the Xtool S1 down in the comment section below. And if you guys appreciate these very in-depth videos, be sure to subscribe. And if you're looking to support me and my work, check out my website, embracemaking.com where you'll find all of those exclusive upgrades and accessories for the S1, as well as many other laser cutters and engravers that I've shown you guys throughout all of my videos. Thanks for watching and thank you again to Xtool for sending me the S1.